My name is Constant Brand. I am from the press office at the European Environment Agency here in Copenhagen. Uh, today, uh, we are discussing the marine environment and Europe's seas and how healthy they are. Uh, joining us today is a full panel of experts from our uh, agency, including Eva Jalabert, uh, Johnny Reker, and Monica Peterlin. Welcome. Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Excellent. Hello. Then we will begin. So um, before uh, we get into it, of course, uh, welcome to our, sh to our show this afternoon. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please put them down in the comment section right below us here on the video on Facebook Live and we will make sure our experts see them. Um, let's start our uh, session on marine environment. Uh, we, of course, published an important uh, marine messages uh, um, mid last year, I believe, uh, which was quite a key important report looking at the health of Europe's seas. Uh, Johnny, I'll throw the first question to you. Uh, what work do you do in the marine environment area? Well, at the EA, our main focus is really on, on the state of marine environment in the seas around Europe. This means on one side, we look on marine biodiversity, whether it's seals and birds and fish, or on the other side, we also take into account the human activities and the pressures that they uh, exert on the marine environment. This can be key drives of change like climate change, non-indigenous species, pollutions, whether it's contaminants or eutrophication with nutrients or uh, marine litter for that matter. We also look into the increased use of the seas um, as part of the, let's say, energy transformation, a lot of uh, focus go towards the sea with uh, offshore wind. We also look into overexploitation of especially fish stocks and so on. So that's sort of one side that we help inform European policies with. Then we have a I guess this is the main part of our work is really to support the implementation of especially the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the two major directives. This include uh, handling the reporting, the data, harmonizations, and so on. So, okay, and these are the these are the key uh, EU legislation in this area on on, on marine environment. Um, that we are handling. There's also yeah. elements under the common fisheries policy and so on, but this is not um, directly the EA domain. Okay, and just to go a bit here, uh, because Eva and, and Monica are here too, uh, how do you divide the work up between yourselves in this important area? Maybe like I'll to... say, yeah. I, th I think that we, we just to, to say very shortly, we have a shared brain. We are very privileged people because we get along really well. We are on the same wavelength. Uh, and then it just flows with a lot of interruptions, a lot of iterations, a lot of completing each other things. We have different skills, all of us, but we've learned to, be, to, to, to bring them all together for the common good, let's say. I just wanted to say on the legislation, Johnny mentioned three pieces of key EU legislation to protect the marine environment that we handle different parts of. These ones we handle quite a lot because we also handle the data reporting, but the marine environment in the EU is under a lot of different pieces of legislation. That, that was the legislation to actually protect it. But there is a lot of legislation on how to use it. And it's very, very, very extensive and also affects the land because everything started in the sea, life started in the sea, but everything ends up in the sea from the land. So there is a lot of legislation at the EU level that is relevant for the marine environment. Thanks. Uh, Monica, can I, uh, this is a good segue to the next question. What data do we collect at the agency uh, in this area? Well, we, we collect uh, different, several types of data. Well, some of the first piece of uh, uh, data group comes from regula regular data flows that include reporting of monitoring data from implementation of various directives. Uh, we issue data calls for data on marine pollution, on, on emissions, and on biodiversity. And based on those data, we, we then develop EA indicators that you can find online. Uh, another piece of uh, information or data that we um, ask for is directive reportings. This means that we get aggregated data such uh, from policies such as water framework directive or a marine strategy framework directive 
and you can, for example, see EA product uh, on online dashboards that we prepared based on Marine Strategy Framework Directive reporting. Uh, this dashboard is available in Wise Marine. We also have well, a volunteer- can, can, I, can I just, sorry, can, 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 uh, some viewers might not know what Wise Marine is. Can you also just briefly explain what that is? A Wise Marine is our portal that uh, aggregates everything that our marine team works on. So we, 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 pre, we have their indicators, maps, uh, data sets, et cetera. So whoever needs it or wants to get into deep, deeper into what we pro produce, uh, it, you can find it on the Wise Marine. Excellent. And uh, can I ask my team, if, if uh, my colleagues, if they can put a link to that under the chat so they easily have access to that as well. Yeah, it's the water information system for Europe, the marine component of that. Why? Excellent. Cool. Yeah, it's quite new because it was uh, finalized at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. And we also use Copernicus, the satellite system as well? Uh, in... Yes, uh, we also use satellite observation uh, from many sources, but main source are Copernicus land and Copernicus marine data. Uh, I would like to emphasize that Copernicus also uses other high-tech equipment, so they also collect in situ data to calibrate their uh, satellite observations so that they are really uh, linked to the ground. Uh, and they're very valuable and uh, they, they go through a lot of development currently. Uh, there is a lot of uh, optimism in the Copernicus now, for, so we, we are also hoping for much more development in the Copernicus domain. So high tech is, sorry, uh, so high tech is making a big difference now when it comes to the future of data collection because we can see so many more things. Well, how, well. How, just a sec, just a sec. But how did it work in the past? Did people go out on boats and, and collect data on, on? Still do. Yeah, but they still do that. <laughs> they, still, okay. they still dive, they collect data very deep and so on. So it's not, uh, it's not in some cases yet uh, possible to collect, for example, information on marine biodiversity because satellites uh, still do not uh, facilitate that. Uh, so this is still under development, I think, or maybe there will be some other approaches that will be used for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> Eva, Eva, you want to come in on the boat? <gasps> I wish I was on a boat. It is the best, <laughs> the best job in the world is when you're there with the nets counting things. No, but seriously now all this remote sensing is fantastic and is helping us a lot on all the physical parameters of the sea for example the temperature for example the sea ice for example the the acidification there's a lot of things that we get remotely let's say but there's still no system that sort of looks at and counts fish i'm sure that somebody very clever is now developing proxies based on what the satellites do, which is mm. mainly do things with light. So yeah. it's a light-based thing. So at some point, somebody will, will come up with proxies, but this is still not the case. So thank God, and we're always, always very pleased, and we put it in our reports, thank God for the people that go out to monitor in situ, because it's expensive, because it's difficult. And it's because difficult. There is, yeah, and there is not much of it ongoing, actually. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Monica. Yeah. Yes, uh, I would like to bring your attention to another data group that, if I may say, uh, Marine Litter Watch. This is different uh, type of data. We are collecting uh, this uh, using EEA, EEA app that is available online. And uh, this is uh, voluntary monitoring. And they, people, anybody can download the app, go out and monitor marine litter on coastlines. Uh, you, this has been used uh, on coastlines of the sea, but also for rivers or lakes, so it doesn't need to be salty water. Uh, litter is unfortunately everywhere, so and, and we are very happy to, to, to accommodate and to collect this data. I would also like to say that this activity is uh, linked uh, also to the activities of non-governmental organizations who organize uh, cleanup activities once or twice a year. 
and uh, they also organize uh, the monitoring with the Marine Little Watch mm -hmm. app prior to this collection. So it's it's uh, linked to entire society that is concerned about um, marine litter. In yeah, country. and we'll get to the the solutions bit uh, a bit later. What, what what's happening to to change it? But now, what is all this data saying? Look behind me here. How healthy are your seas? Who wants to take that on? What did our recent report say? Well, maybe if I if I can say a few words about litter, L litter is everywhere. It's uh, it's amazing. You can find it in uh, in in drinking water, even in air. It's in the sea on the on the surface of the sea, in the water column, on the seabed, in deep sea. So this is really something that we need to pay attention and to actively contribute because it's very much related to our behavior, how we actually uh, use uh, plastic, what we do with it, do we, do we try to avoid it and uh, support activities that are uh, trying to get rid of the plastic and we should, we should all really contribute to that. Yeah, good. Uh, Eva, you want to tackle what, uh, what's the basic... Uh... Yeah conclusion we made in that report yeah i mean sadly uh, the state of our seas is still is still generally poor yeah. uh, we did a first big monograph in 2015 which was the first cycle let's say more or less coincided with the first cycle of the implementation of the of the marine strategy framework directive which is a groundbreaking law to protect the marine environment which uh, ranges from the late 2000s and there we saw a picture that was not very pretty. And we saw that the situation was generally poor and that we are not using the resources in the sea and the space in the sea in a way that is sustainable. And what happens, as I said earlier, upstream is not very good either and that ends up in the sea. And what we see now, now we have done this report in June 2020 was launched, which is called Marine Messages 2, because we had done an earlier one, Marine Messages 1, which was like and a we'll, summary. And we'll put the link down in the, in the comment section as yeah. well. Yeah, go ahead. So this 2015 report, we did very big monograph, State of Europe Seas. Then we did a sort of summary, Marine Messages 1. And now we have done a, a hybrid between the two, which is Marine Messages 2. And we see a, that the situation is still generally poor. We see that there is only about 7% of the area of Europe seas that is not under at least two types of pressure. We see that pollution from nutrients, which leads to eutrophication and from contaminants is still quite concerning in certain areas. And we also see the same with invasive alien species. Then we are more aware, as Monica has been mentioning, because there was no data, but then we developed the citizen science project. We're more aware of marine litter, especially plastic, which is very widespread, like Monica just said. And then we also see that physical damage to the seabed continues, especially near the coastal areas where most of the pressures are concentrated because there is where most of the human activity leading to this pressure so, takes sorry, place. But when we talk about pressure, what do we mean? We mean uh, trawler fishermen, we mean yeah, uh, so, climate change, we mean... No, what? no, I was, I was talking concretely now, I've been talking about other pressures, pollution from different types. Yeah. Now I was talking about physical damage, mm -hmm. abrasion, for example, to the seabed which can come from many activities, is closer to the coast because there is where more activities take place. And mm -hmm. one of the key culprits is bottom trawling from fishing. I then see. fishing okay. exerts other types of pressure, for example, mainly on the target species that are being fished, which are the commercial um, fish and shellfish stocks. And that has improved in some areas, but is pretty bad in others. Nevertheless, there are also, you can look at our report, chapters three and four give you information on this with a lot of detail. They, there should also be said, and it's important to recognize that they are good examples of things that have gone right. Okay. They, they are. Eva, should, should I say that? Um, yes. I think it's a key point. Um, for example, for some 40 years ago, they decided to remove DDT. From, uh, from the Baltic Sea, 
which seems to influence the reproductive capacity of the white-tailed the eagle. And after 35 years, that population of uh, white-tailed uh, eagles actually recovered. We're seeing the same also an example from the Baltic Sea, where they have agreed uh, through the Baltic Sea Action Plan to reduce uh, the amount of um, nutrient coming into the Baltic Sea and recovery are starting. But again, it's prote protected to take more than 100 years before good status is um, due to natural process will be achieved. So it has an effect when we do something, but the ecosystem takes sometimes a long time to um, react. There are also examples where fishing have be been removed from certain areas or active nature restoration has happened where uh, fish species, uh, crabs, shellfish uh, are returning much more quickly. So we have knowledge and we have good examples as well. We, but it seems to be a journey we have just started and which are now picking up uh, more speed with the European Green Deal and the, the two new uh, pillars of the uh, biodiversity strategy and the eighth EAP. So, um, the efforts we do make a change. I think that's really important to say. Yeah, it's a good point. Johnny, before I, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about what waters we're talking about, but of course, we're already getting questions in, so I want to get to them as soon as we can. But Johnny, first, uh, let's talk about the waters. I have a map that you gave me to share. I just want to talk a little bit what what area we're talking about here. Hang on while I... Yeah, no, I um, basically, we often wear out the boundaries. Uh, for the marine work, we have colleagues working on uh, fresh water as well. But for the marine work, we, we work from the coast out to 200 nautical miles. Um, that's where most of the EU legislation covers. In areas like the Baltic Sea, or especially the Mediterranean and Black Sea, we, we work towards the equidistance towards non-EU countries, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, we do not work so much with high seas or overseas territories because we have not so much data coming from there, and uh, this is perhaps a more personal view, we, we do need the data to, to have an informed opinion on what's going on. Um, I know that Europe will take some of our environmental ambitions. I saw uh, von der Leyen just um, mentioned an hour ago that uh, when we go to the next big uh, summit, we will ask for uh, a 30% protection of our oceans. Um, so. Here we, we bring the European experience to those global processes, but uh, as experts at the agency, we, we do focus on these European seas. That, okay. that is on the map. Okay, and uh, before we, we take our first question, um, Ava, how important is the health of our marine waters to our own well being? Well, all those pressures that I was mentioning, they, they then have an impact on marine life, on marine habitats, and marine species. And these are things or these are yeah pieces of the sea that give us a lot so it is the, the sea does not only do things for our well-being it does things for our health mm -hmm. it does things for our livelihoods it does things for the economy more general we are very used to maybe thinking of the sea and thinking fish feeding us fish depend on the state of the sea so if the state of the sea is not doing well that will have impacts from the sea. There's other contributions that the sea makes to people's lives that are like the fish, that they can be affected by a bad state of the sea, but that we don't see them. They are not very visible. And I'm just gonna give you some examples if you let me. For example, the sea gives us quite a lot of the oxygen in the atmosphere. It gives us about 50% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. Marine plants and algae produce that through photosynthesis. So the sea, in a way, keeps us alive through yeah. the oxygen, not just through the food. It also gets atmospheric carbon into the tissue of marine animals and marine plants and algae and fixes it there, removing it permanently or quite for a long time from the atmosphere. So it helps us mitigate climate change at a great cost though, if, for many reasons that we're not gonna get there. It's about 30% of the atmospheric CO2 that we have produced through our activities that ends up in the sea. And a big part of that 
gets fixed into living carbon and makes our ambient climate more habitable to a certain extent because it's getting quite stream at times. We also get medicines. This is the good news of this week or recently. There is, there is this little cute marine animal, which is a sea squirt, which is a type of colony animal like corals and sponges. Sea squirt. A sea squirt is an ascidian. Oh. It's a type of tunicate, but never mind. It's called a sea squirt. If you ch check a photo of this thing, put down <laughs> in Google, tunicates, ascidians, they are like little things with siphons. They are really cute. Anyway, this animal has a, a compound, produces a compound, which is now being trialed and is the biggest antiviral, anti-COVID-19 ever, more like anything that has been, well, there's only one antiviral at the moment. So this thing is now being trialed and people are very proud and the sea gives us medicines. Another thing that the sea does is it gives us opportunities for recreation and leisure, which we get by watching charismatic species like whales or seabirds or turtles from a distance, I don't know, and, or in the water and also being in certain marine habitats. And this has an extremely big contribution to our mental health. And there's been studies during the pandemic and lockdown and all these things when people were allowed to go out a bit and people that went to the beach and into the sea, they got quite a lot out of it. And they are now studies that show that being in the marine environment with the influence of marine life does wonders for people's mental well-being. So these okay. are just some Good. examples. I'm going to have to cut you there because we're going to really need to get to the questions because our time is limited. So uh, the first question is from Dorothea. You said the common fisheries policy is not in your remit. How do you influence issues around overfishing and combating uh, IUU fishing then? Not well, sure well, you you means, but who wants to tackle that one? I'll, I'll take this. Is illegal okay. and regulated unreported fishes. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. We use the data. We use the data from the common fisheries policy um, reporting. We have two problems when it comes to to saying something on the overexploitation of commercial fish stocks. We deal this is if you go into our report, you need to look at table four one there. That helps you a lot. So there's two aspects to this. One, uh, how are the stocks doing? We get information, we process it. Two, how good is this information to really say something about the stocks? The big problem we have is that there is not much information about most stocks. So there is only about 10% of stocks for which we have sufficient information to say if they are fish or not, uh, overfish or not. And when we say something about these stocks, it's only on the ones that have been assessed, okay? So what we see at the moment is that in the Northeast Atlantic and the Baltic, there's been in the last 10, 15 years, big efforts to, to reduce the fishing pressure and they are paying off. This the situation is not really so good at all, op the opposite in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. So that was a good situation. What we get now is that a, there is inertia in the common fisheries policy. And when the 2021, total allowable catches were negotiated last December for about one third of all the stocks on which the EU has a main responsibility, the total allowable catches were set disregarding scientific advice. There is a body or there are several bodies in the EU that produce advice on how much can be caught from the sea. One of them is ISIS, the International Council for Exploration of the Sea. And there, a, the, the total allowable catches did not work. Some of them, as I just said, they are over those limits. So you were doing really well. Suddenly, you seem to not be doing so well. Mm. On top of everything, you have the Green Deal that is asking you to do even better. So there is some sort of not consistency in the system. And we can only report what the system does. We don't have influence on how the system works indirectly only about what we say about it. Indeed, and, that, and that's left for legislators in member states. I just, Johnny, want, quickly want to share this map that works this time, just so we know what we're talking about here. Can you see that? Yes. Then you, you can see the areas uh, covered. The, these are the areas covered by our reporting, is that correct? That is uh, 
correct except for uh, the northern northeastern part of the Barents Sea. Because that, that, that sort of falls out of the Norwegian uh, area, I suppose. Yes, uh, I mean, I think it's important to realize that EA is also, um, one thing is we support the EU member states, but we also so we have a range of um, countries which we collaborate with, like Turkey or uh, Norway, that are non-EU members, but they also um, report environmental data and um, and support the agency as well. So uh, some of our assessments also cover these areas, um, even though our main focus is support to the EU directives, then um, our yeah. EA assessments go broader than that. Good. That, that segues into another question we just got in. I understand that your work area is limited, but can you tackle the pollution problem or the overfishing problem without global coordination and effort? <laughs> Who would like to tackle that one quickly? Well, maybe I can yeah. say a few words about the pollution. Uh, we, we tackle pollution on European level uh, for a long time. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, pollu pollution related uh, legislation. And uh, we, we, of course, uh, follow that uh, through the data, data flows and we developed indicators for related to the, um, to the pollution of nutrient, with nutrients and contaminants, etc. Uh, but now there are also other forms of, um, of pollution that are being addressed and are relevant for the marine domain. That is introduction of energy such as uh, underwater noise or of course biopollution with the uh, alien species uh, that's also now high on the on on the radar of the commission for the action johnny you wanted to come in yeah um I also it's a slight different example but i think it illustrates quite well um for both with the IOMF countries and eu we collect data on marine protected areas um, and harmonize it in our databases available online, the common database on designated areas and ISO 2000. This we compile, provide input to um, the marine directive, the nature directives and the EU biodiversity strategy, but we also report it to um, a UN support body. So we, in, on behalf of Europe, bring it into sustainable development goals, in this case, the 14.5. Um, so, so that's the sort of technical advice. We have colleagues that do contribute to directly to UN processes, but it is less of a focus here because it's a completely kettle of um, fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, uh, to our viewers, uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, please get them down uh, in our comment section. We only have a few minutes left, but uh, if you get them in, uh, we can try and get them in for you. And I have another question from Kara. Uh, if I buy fish to eat, I would like to know, is it from sustainable fisheries, but which label can I trust? I'm not sure yeah. if we cover that area, but Eva. Yeah, this is, this is something that we are informed. We don't work directly with, yeah. but we are informed. There are several certification schemes, and they are also people that audit all these things. One thing is a certification scheme, pretty, pretty solid one. For example, is the Mar Marine Stewardship Council. But what you should do which is also extremely useful. Most environmental NGOs, so you check the web pages of your environmental NGO, your local one, they produce lists of fish and they have different criteria, not only the, the production chain, but many other things like season, a level of exploitation, that year, things like that. And then they tell you um, what is uh, the most suitable option. And, and, and it would be lovely if everybody did this. You know, I'm a ob conscientious objector, meaning that I hardly ever eat fish. And when I eat fish, I am extremely careful and I look at all these things. Thanks, that's, a, that's a good, some good advice there. Um, uh, we haven't talked too much about climate change. What, uh, can, can somebody explain uh, what the impact, specific impacts of climate change are on the marine environment? Johnny. I guess yes. <laughs> uh, I think it's a big uh, topic. It's uh, huge. Uh, I, I think um, what we can see is the climate change coming on top of all the other pressures. 
and it's a much more long-term uh, fight against it. What we are seeing, for example, just last year, um, there were no sea ice in the Baltic Sea uh, around Latvia and Estonia, and that caused a lot of decisions to uh, be on land rather than on the sea ice. Um, and they estimated that they lost around 50% of the pups um, because they couldn't be uh, at sea, basically. I think we are also seeing uh, long-term changes. Species are moving north where they are able to, um, or they go deeper if they can. Um, for example, I've seen, um, as part of the common fisheries policy, a lot of uh, valuable information is collected on commercially exploited fish. And here we can see that there is not a strong northward movement um, from Spain into the North Sea and, and further north. Uh, that's a long-term change. Unfortunately, we're also seeing extreme events like uh, marine heat waves in the Mediterranean Sea. And a heat wave is when the uh, temperature is above a certain limit. Um, and if it stays there, for a, a long time, like two or three months, which were the case in 2003, for example, it can really wipe out, um, especially species that lives in, in the upper part of the, the water. Um, so in this example, we lost 80% of more than 25 species of soft corals in the Met. So um, we've seen bleaching, we've seen bleaching in the Mediterranean. Uh, and death, and death. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't know whether it's ble uh, bleaching per se. It's uh, it's simply killed the species, also the sponges and so on. And I've just been just this month been released an example from Israel, where they uh, say basically we have lost ninety percent of the um, mollusk over a long time period, which is catastrophic. So yeah. it's these changes, the, the long term changes, but also the extreme events. We can move on to ocean acidification or um, loss of oxygen. This is also a challenge in especially coastal areas, all yeah, increased by uh, the effects from climate change. Okay. But, uh, yeah, uh, we need to wrap up now, but uh, I, I think I li I'd like to throw a bit more a positive spin, uh, optimistic note, a uh, last question yeah. to all three of you. Um, we have a new strategy, biodiversity strategy. We have a European Green Deal. Uh, how can we turn things around? What's being done? What's Europe doing? The EU is doing. Well, Johnny, you want to start? Yeah, I can start. I think first of all, um, there's an increased awareness. I think we all can see that um, from the political side of things, they have uh, increased budgets uh, quite a lot. For example, the European Investment Bank have increased uh, its budget for climate. Uh, related projects with 150%. So it's now half of the, of the funds. The structural funds are doing the same. So right now, focus is really on finding concrete restoration projects. Can we restore sustra beds? Can we uh, restore the seagrass beds, basically? Can we restore um, wetland areas and so on and, and buy more CO2? Um, I think there's a lot of funding coming into these projects. And now it's about real action, taking the knowledge we have and bring it into action in both, well, in all our ecosystems, not just marine. Uh, maybe Eva, Monica will supplement. Yeah, just a sec. Uh, we do have a last question in which segues into what, what points we're making here from Todd. You mentioned some measures. Uh, what is realistic for the realistic timeline for achieving sustainability? Is this achievable? If we can bring that into your final remarks as well. Uh, who would, Ava, you want to? Yeah, if you go to our report, Marine Messages 2, and you look at Chapter 5, we make all these reflections in there. And we are inspired in making all these reflections by the lessons that we have learned while looking at things that have worked out well. And we put a timeline of maybe 2030, and now there is all this push. So things that have to be done is to implement the legislation. The legislation in the EU is fantastic to protect the marine environment, but people are not respecting it very much. Use the opportunities with the new instruments that are supposed to fill gaps and to give it another push financially also. But be coherent because we cannot have all this fantastic stuff and then people keep on putting, and this is an example again, but keep on putting limits to, to, to the extraction of fish 
that are higher than what the scientists are saying, then why do we need all these laws and why do we need all these opportunities? Things have to be coherent. So this is the type of things that we have put forward in this chapter. Let me just find a, yeah. I wanted to say something on climate change because a climate change, as Johnny was saying, takes a long time to reverse, but is a pressure added to the others in the sea. So you could increase resilience in the sea if you tackle the other pressures importantly, and that gives overall resilience, and that gives overall planetary resilience in a way, because the sea is the bastion, the last bastion of climate change resilience yeah. planetarily. Good point, yeah. Monica, you want to wrap it up for us? Yeah, maybe uh, I could add a few things about the implementation of legislation and uh, the effects of the new Green Deal. Uh, I, uh, I heard uh, say in the commission uh, that whatever you cannot measure, you cannot uh, manage. So I think that this kind of uh, approach towards uh, sort of uh, enforcing a little bit better the monitoring can really help uh, to control and uh, implement uh, policies uh, in the short term and long term. Because uh, if, you, if you don't know how effective you are in the, in the management, it's very difficult to correct uh, approaches. And I can see that there is a lot of activities uh, going in the direction of cooperating uh, across uh, different, uh, different um, groups of uh, people who, who were uh, taking care of planning or so the, the before, before the protection and planning was not really communicating very well. For example, the maritime special planning was going on a little bit without considering the environmental aspects. And this is start, starting now to develop so that these things will get closer and uh, being considered in the future, hopefully, because it's still the process. And uh, I hope that this will improve significantly based on the Green Deal. Indeed. And I think the message is watch the space. Uh, Johnny, I'm sorry, we really have to cut it off now, but again, if you have any more questions or comments, please put, jot them down and uh, we will make sure that our experts see them and we'll get back to you. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, this is a huge subject area, an important subject area, and definitely we'll get back to this. And uh, the EA will, and our three experts here, I'd like to thank them for their time and their lively discussion today. I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us today and uh, hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye.